Hello and welcome to Lesson 9, Institutionalisation. In this session we're going to look at the effects of being institutionalised on the development of children and we're going to look at a new type of attachment disorder called disinhibited attachment. So, what is institutionalisation? Well, it's a term for the effects of living in an institutional setting or the result of institutional care. An institution can be anything from a hospital to, a, to an orphanage or a, some sort of structured home in which children are raised. One attachment disorder that's been associated with institutionalisation is disinhibited attachment. This is characterised by a pattern of behaviour in which the child actively approaches and interacts with unfamiliar adults. As you know from the strange situation, the normal behaviour to strangers is to exhibit strange anxiety to avoid them and to get distressed if your mother leaves you alone with them. In these children's cases, they have no or very little strange anxiety and they will immediately beeline for these uh, adults. The symptoms are attention-seeking, clinginess, social behaviour directed indiscriminately towards adults and it needs to be stressed, these are both familiar and unfamiliar. So they will act often in the same way to a complete stranger as they would to their uh, key worker. So one of the early studies that investigated this was Tizard and Hodges. So they found 65 children who were raised in institutions until the age of four. What was interesting about these institutions is whilst they provided a lot of physical care and had stimulating environment with toys and things, staff were discouraged from forming an attachment. The predominant belief was that if children formed secure attachments and then the staff members left, that that would be more damaging than if the children didn't form attachments in the first place. So it was really important to sort of protect them. So they discouraged staff from, from doing such things. By age two, most of the children had had up to 24 different carers. And by age four, this had risen to 50 to 70, depending on the child. So this means that they never had a single opportunity to form a specific attachment with any of their carers. By two, children started to exhibit um, disinhibited attachment, this unusual attachment behaviour. Now this was a natural experiment. Participants, in this case the children, were not randomly allocated to different conditions. This was a real institution. And what Tizard and Hodges did was they analysed the consequences later on. So the reason why it was a natural experiment is because three independent variables arose out of this um, study, and those were some of the children were returned to their biological parents. We call this group the restored group. Some were adopted into new families, and some were fostered and put back and forth from, from the institution. The effect and the, and the later consequence of institutionalisation was then followed up and it was found, uh, unsurprisingly, that the adopted children had all formed quite strong relationships and attachments with their new parents, or, or most of them did, I should say. Um, the restored children had fewer specific attachments and their attachment generally was weaker than the, the adopted. There's many reasons why this might be, and we'll talk about them in a minute. But most stark was that the group that were fostered and then constantly returned showed extremely high levels of disinhibited attachment. So that shows that the result of institutionalisation, the cause of which is something like emotional deprivation, can result in attachment disorders later in life. You don't form a secure attachment with a specific individual as a child, so you rapidly attach to people um, indiscriminately almost. It's almost like they're stuck in that indiscriminate stage. We, you know, from a baby, as Schaefer and Emerson said, they pass day social, they're in, indiscriminate, and they're just trying to form attachments with anything or anyone that'll move, uh, that moves. So, that's Tizard and Hodges. Now, it's worth noting that it is possible that the reason why many of the children who were adopted form strong attachments to their caregivers and the restored families uh, struggled, or the restored children struggled with their family, it may be that uh, adoptee parents, or parents of adoptees, try harder. You know, these are people who really, really, really want kids. 
and they may put a lot more effort and be more sensitive so we could bring Ainsworth in to sort of back this up. Uh, it could also be that if you think about the biological parents that the children were restored to, there was a reason they had to give them up in the first place and it's possible that even though they become capable of providing care, the quality of care may have been an issue and we'll come back to that later. Another study, so if you haven't read uh, Rutter's study, pause the video, read it in detail first because I'm just going to summarise and talk about the evaluations. Welcome back, so Rutter found further evidence for disinhibited attachment. He found that uh, children who were broadly speaking adopted before six months showed very little disinhibited attachment but the later this got, the adoption, the later it got after six months, the higher the percentage. So uh, over one quarter, 26.1% showed marked disinhibited attachment uh, compared to only 3.8% for UK adoptives. So this suggests that disinhibited attachment are more likely in children who have experienced longer periods of institutionalization. So now we've got a, a variable, we've got the time spent in the institution that matters and possibly the quality of care if we take the adoptee parents in Tizard study as variables. Really good study, Rutter's study is still continuing to this day and the findings will continuously be updated. I'll show you where you can find these uh, later. Now, there is an issue. Remember when we talked about Kagan, we said there was a temperament hypothesis. In Rutter's study, children that were adopted um, were not necessarily randomly done so, were they? If you go into an adoption agency, what sort of factors are going to influence your, your um, desire to adopt a child? Well, there might be all sorts of factors, such as how easy temperament they have. You know, if you walk into an adoption uh, agency or adoption uh, institution in an orphanage and there's a kid lying on the floor crying, you might not want to pick that one because you think, oh, he's got problems, you know, it's going to be hard. Whereas you might pick the easy one, he smiles easy and is relaxed. So actually the people who were adopted, the, the babies that were adopted before six months, may have been those easier babies and that's why they didn't develop a uh, marked disinhibited attachment. So it might actually be that uh, it's not institutionalization or the, or the length, it may be that the, the less vulnerable babies were the ones that were adopted at six months. And if they'd stayed in there for longer, they would have shown uh, some marked disinhibited attachment. That might affect the internal validity, what are the long-term effects, how generalizable is a Romanian sample. These institutions were dirt poor and the quality of care was non-existent, but many of them were also malnourished. How do you isolate physical deprivation or privation from emotional privation? You know, not getting enough food, physical privation, and not getting enough emotional uh, support, um, you know, stimulus, emotional deprivation or privation. So uh, this is kind of the point here, put into a sort of PE structure. So you would then conclude with this matters because or therefore, and that would give you a strong point. Um, we didn't mention about intellectual stimulation, but there was a severe lack of this. And I'll show you a video which will uh, break your heart, no doubt, on how these children were actually treated. Um, Rutter has internal validity, so Previous days, there's been a number of sort of extraneous variables that could influence it. Trauma, abuse, neglect. If we look at case studies of children being separated from their, from their parents. Uh, so saying institutionalization was the sole cause, it's not fair. However, in the case of Romanian orphans, so many of them were adopted, or sorry, placed in the orphanage at such a young age, very little physical or emotional uh, abuse could have actually occurred. So we are dealing more or less with the effects of institutionalization, though of course we've got the Kagan's temperament hypothesis, which might influence it as well. Uh, it's possible as well, just going back to that, that easy babies resist institutionalizational effects longer. And maybe if they stayed in the orphanage, they would have still come out better overall. Um, practical implications, applications. This has influenced how we care for children, just like Bobby's maternal deprivation and his internal working model research uh, and theory 
changed the way hospitals sort of room parents with children now. It's changed the way we care for children in institutions. So every carer, um, every child has a key worker, and that key worker is directly responsible for them. This trickles down to even daycare. My daughter has a key worker at daycare, who, and she's primarily responsible for that child. It's all designed to create a secure attachment figure uh, whom the child can go to and, and develop a, uh, an emotional bond, emotional bond, emotional bond. We could jump to sort of determinism as well. One of the issues with this is that if we look at Rutter's effect, he's saying that being adopted early from an institution essentially uh, reduces the risk of disinhibit attachment and other things. Some of the other consequences of being raised in institutional care and maternal deprivation, as we found earlier, were things like low IQ. But is this deterministic? Can this ever be fixed? The, ch the children in you know, the maternal deprivation studies who had IQs of 68, is that then doomed forever? Or is it just a, um, you know, a temporary effect? Even if it isn't, this could lead to a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're a child raised in an institution and you believe that you know, because you lacked the opportunities that you're probably you know, less intelligent or whatever, well, you may try less hard in school and that may, uh, you may prove yourself right ultimately through your own actions. So this is a difficult point to make, but it's one worth considering. And then finally, the quality of care. We hit on this with maybe the uh, adoptive parents providing better quality of care than the biological one in Tizard and Hodge's study. Here, Dant has carried out research, this is in your guide notes, uh, where he showed that by providing a key worker, improving the emotional uh, support that children uh, received, that you could eliminate many of these negative effects, including low IQ and attachment disorders. So that is an overview of institutionalisation and how it affects uh, children who are placed in them. It has huge implications for the real world. We have large numbers of children in care. If you think of the Syrian migrant crisis of 2015-2016, uh, these are children coming unaccompanied. They're going to wind up in the care system. Getting this right is really important for the health and mental and physical of, of children. But that's just a broad overview. Uh, we'll talk more about it in the lesson. But as always, thank you very much for your time, and I will see you around. Bye.